Um, well, well, we'll we'll redo the intro, uh, I guess. But <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess uh, this video was recorded, you know, three or four months ago when I was driving through New York. Um, I stopped by your house and I recorded you painting this picture. Um, it's uh, yeah, it just have a landscape, and you're just I guess going through your process for how you start one of your paintings that you post on Instagram and. Um, yeah, I was really curious about your process and how you how you did it. So it was, um, you know, oh, do you want to talk about what you're doing in the video right now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this painting is a is an acrylic painting. Um, when I do these, I usually do them on um, just like a small sheet of mixed media or watercolor paper. Um, and when I'm doing them inside my studio, I I attach them to this board that I can um, just like keep pretty secure on my, my studio easel. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just taping it to that. Um, yeah, uh, the scene is a, is a photo I took last winter, I think, um, just on one of my walks through the woods. It's, um, it's just trees in the woods with snow. Yeah. Um, but I, I love these scenes because there's just so many composition, um, so many ways to uh, make a composition work, moving things around and finding interesting shapes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, part of the you know beauty, I think, of plein air painting specifically is that I think I hear all the time on the internet that people don't know what to paint or what to draw. And uh, again, the beauty of plein air painting is that you can literally paint anything around you, whether it's just like a forest or trees or, you know, just a, a bush outside or something, you know, there's not, there's never an excuse not to paint, it seems like. Um, and yeah, that's, I'm always, <clears throat> I'm always surprised. Like I'll, um, so yesterday I was um, driving home from church and I, on my way, I, I saw these really cool, I don't know what kind of trees they were, they were these white trees. Um, they weren't birch trees, but um, they were like massive and they had really interesting trunks. So I, I knew I could take a photo and have it. Like I could have slowed down. I could have probably parked and taken a couple photos. But I, would, I was doing that for a couple weeks now. And I was getting in kind of into a rut of what um, yeah. photos were doing with my paintings and how I was interpreting them. So I, I just kind of like really looked at the tree and just took like a really long um, mental note of it right. and um, I got home and I immediately did a painting of it and I was like if you consciously take all and it comes with experience and mileage and painting too to have the to know what to look for and to like make a strong image of it but I um, I was able to do a painting that I was happier with than is than if I did take a photo probably. And I was happier with this painting than the ones that I was doing um, from photos for the past week or so. Um, and I never would have guessed on my on my drive home, just like, and it always ends up being that, the weirdest places, um, just like yeah. um, you see something and it, it, it's gotta like uh, resonate and um, really impact you. To, um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, to, to me, it, the more I get into art, the more it seems like your job as an artist is more to like interpret shapes rather than to copy things one one for one. And like in the painting you're, you know, right now, uh, it's literally, you're just, you know, you put like some pillars for trees and then you're putting in some purples and, and mm -hmm. stuff to indicate the idea of what the ground might have looked like, you know? Yeah. But it, it's not like you're taking a color picker and doing it exactly the way you see it. You know, you're doing an interpretation of what. Mm -hmm. What it is. Yeah, um, color has kind of, um, it hasn't, I don't want to say it has come naturally, but it's come with um, just doing, probably at this point I've done thousands of paintings. And so I don't really think about color too much, at least in the beginning. Sometimes in the end I have to uh, reel it in and like place some very specific color notes um, yep. throughout the piece to unite it more. But I'm not thinking about color really. I'm thinking of darks and lights, values basically, and um, composition and shapes. So um, I'm not attached to anything in the painting at this point. I'm just kind of getting a feel for, 
I'm kind of just blocking it in, in a, with a, like my first idea for the scene. Right. And it, it could change and it will change probably a few times throughout uh, the painting, sometimes more than others. Sometimes I get lucky and it's, it's like right on the first, for the first like part of the block in and then I just kind of uh, keep it. Um, I just have to refine it a little bit, but um, yeah, I the whole exp the whole um, process of painting for me is just kind of uh, playing around and finding, messing around with shapes and seeing what works compositionally. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and again, to me, it seems like doing a beautiful painting is a combination of just pure intuition, just seeing what fits and what doesn't, and then some amount of actual planning and you know just uh, like actual planning and getting an idea for what for, for what you're painting to, like technically you know but it, mm -hmm. it to me it seems like mostly the kind of stuff that i like is more of the intuitive sort of artwork yeah or at least um paintings that look like they were kind of whipped out in like yeah half, that half an hour or something those are the ones that really speak to me yeah yeah i, I i'm a huge fan of surgeon's watercolor paintings and mm. um you know, like some of his sketches that he had in the Italian countryside of, you know, alligators or trees or any of that kind of stuff has always been really, really cool to me. Um, yeah. And he, he would always say like he would work incredibly hard to make it look like he did a painting with almost no effort, you know. He'd spend three hours to make a fresh stroke look like it, you know, he just did it, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, it's funny that you bring that up because like, I was thinking about that lately and my process has slowly, um, I've started to understand that a little bit more and more as I paint. Um, at the beginning, it was really hard to like wrap your head around that mindset. It was like a lot of pressure to put the perfect brush stroke down yeah. um, when you're like really first learning. Um, but now I see it in my own paintings where I know if a, if a part of the painting isn't working right, because I know it's getting too tedious or it could be solved with one brush stroke or like one wipe of the paper towel or something. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's not done that way. I, it just bothers me until I fix it. So I've started to, um, slowly, um, understand that that way of thinking that sergeant had it's pretty cool yeah yeah well and again it, it's uh to me it seems like if you want to do art professionally and consistency or consistently you can't be obsessing over every single brush stroke otherwise you will like die of self-criticism or something you know mm. and uh i'm i'm really impressed by the amount of work that you put out like you do a painting a day pretty much right um, yeah, so you're probably ref referring to when I was doing the daily paintings, I was doing like a, a small acrylic or gouache, or I started casein too, but I was doing one of those um, each day. I was painting more than that, but I was working to get a, a finished painting done and posted up for sale each day. Yeah. Um, I was really inspired by uh, Nicholas Uribe um the colombian painter he was doing a similar thing um putting it up there for sale and um yeah i thought it was going to be a good way to um sorry i'm like looking at you but i'm looking at me painting too so i don't know <laughs> what that would have been but um yeah so i was inspired to do that and just i thought it was gonna really push me um and it did for the longest time to get to get better to like learn and um it was good but i got to the point where um i felt like i needed more time to um to think through the painting to think through the process and um um yeah so i i kind of stopped doing them and i started getting back i was doing oil paintings all throughout the couple of years of doing the daily paintings, but um, I I haven't done an acrylic painting now in a few months because I've just been doing a ton of oil paintings. I'll, I'll do like, I'll start, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm a pretty quick painter, so I'll do like a few paintings a day, but none of them are really done. I'll, I'll like do one, get to a stopping point, and then I'll start another one. 
And that's a much healthier way to work for me, like right now in my um, learning journey, I feel like. Um, and I'm learning a ton right now. I, in the past couple of months, I've, I've learned a ton. So I'm not really doing a finished painting every day. I'm not really working that way yeah. anymore. Um, sometimes it works out where that's the case, or sometimes it's two or three finished paintings a day, but um, I'm kind of doing lots of starts to paintings. And sometimes a few days later, I'll, I'll grab one and I'll, I'll know what it needs to, um, to finish it up now. Yeah. Well, and I, have you ever read the art spirit? Uh, uh, what was that? The art spirit. Have you ever read the art spirit? Oh yeah. 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 In it, I think he says, uh, if you do enough starts, the finishes take care of themselves, you know? Yeah. To, to a lot of people, the idea of doing giant oil paintings, big finished illustrations is, is really scary and intimidating, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know where to start exactly where, with that kind of work. It just seems a lot, it, it is a lot more intimidating to do a two foot by two foot painting or, you know, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But to me, it seems like the way you get past that fear and gain that practice is you, is you do lots and lots of small paintings. Like, yeah. would you say that doing those small paintings really had a big influence on your on your larger work? Um, yes and no. Um, like, I, um, I don't know. I it definitely helped me speed up my process. Like, I can, I can just paint really fast and get like a somewhat finished. Um, like I. I can get the values down like at this stage in the painting now that you see it's it's um like it's recognizable um it's not like a super strong piece or anything yet but it's um it it just needs like a little like um i don't know if if i if i was at the stage now i could probably spend 10 more minutes and finish it um, yeah yeah right but um it, 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 I, it is, yeah it's 10 minutes into the painting already so it's yeah 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 there you go so um but like do it with doing the the oil paintings now um like i like what you were saying like i i have to do i have to like not care as much I, if i can start a painting um and just get it just think about getting it down and finished as fast as possible that helps me a ton and not really worrying about how much paint I'm using, not worrying about how much, if I'm wasting time, if I'm wasting canvas, um, I can't think about anything like that. I just have to think about like finishing the painting and I can, um, and not, well, not worrying about um, creating a masterpiece either. Just getting a, um, getting a good composition on the canvas and um and as quickly as possible and then on to the next one that's probably the most important part is there'll be another one right after this i'm just going to keep going keep going and then you're not um you're not worried about waking up in the morning starting a painting and it's going to be this three by four foot masterpiece and it's going to take me three weeks to do like that puts a lot of pressure on you um to to not make any mistakes along the way to or you can make mistakes and then wait for it to dry and then you can paint over it like all those right. things you can do um but um the whole that way has never helped me um it's right. it's about like speed and um uh, uh right. I, I don't know the right way to say it but like the the quality of um brush strokes like the minimal um amount of um brush strokes and work basically. yeah yeah did, did you mean something like like uh rehearsing you know it's like you're rehearsing to do a big painting or is it or like um, sometimes you have to rehearse a little bit but um yeah it's funny like i'll do those um like a few paintings i'll get like a few I can get like a few really good starts in a day. And sometimes those are 30 by 40s, three 30 by 40s. Sometimes they're 12 by 12s um, or sometimes even smaller. The size 
doesn't really matter anymore when you're just thinking about big shapes. Like you can block in a shape like this right. big pretty quick if you're not worried about all the intricacies inside of it. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it would literally take like 10 seconds to fill that in with a big brush. So, yeah. <laughs> and that, that can, that's, a, that's probably a, a quarter of a, of a painting, that size shape. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, well, and it's a, I think that's an important rule to recognize in painting is that it's uh, painting a giant mural, you know, like a 30 foot by 40 foot mural has the same rules for painting as doing a, you know, one inch by two inch painting, you know? <laughs> It's like a, as long as you just uh, think of the big shapes and the overall composition and all of that and the values, the fundamentals, that stuff translates to doing really beautiful pictures really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a matter of technique of like covering 20 feet of wall is different coloring, covering like a centimeter, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, so uh, do you want to talk about your materials at all? Like you, you said, this is a uh, acrylic, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I like a heavy body paint, um, no matter what medium. So like with acrylic, I'll use, um, golden is probably the best, but I can't always justify the price. Um, so there's. Um, there's good enough brands like sometimes the there's like um um like like blick i think even makes their own acrylic paint that's pretty decent it's pretty like thick and um and it's pretty cheap or um what is it i think it's amsterdam i think makes a acrylic paint so like, i don't know any type of um like thick body acrylic um, paint. And same goes with oil painting. Like I like a, a heavy paint, yeah. um, but I use the, the primaries, um, ultramarine blue, like some kind of cad red, naphthol red, or, and then like a cad yellow or um, uh, I don't know what else is close to that, but something close to cad yellow. I, I like a, a saturated blue, a saturated red, a deep saturated red and then um a warm saturated yellow like i don't really want a really bright cold yellow okay. um because i can mix warm warmer warmer darks um the warmer colors i have and warmer darks are pretty important they have always been pretty important to me um having pretty deep reds and oranges in the in the darkest darks Right. Um, and then white, titanium white. I've used that simple palette for probably a couple of years now. Um, it used to be so much more complicated and it wasn't really helping me. All those complicated, having, having like two different yellows, two reds, a green, earth colors, um, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue. Like it just, it was complicating it was stressing me out too. It was, um, it wasn't helping it. Now I, I have, I, I think so much more simply when I'm painting, I think I mix a big puddle of dark and a big puddle of light. And then I just tint them to the, um, to the temperature and the value, if it's a subtle value change, um, that I need. So like with this one, I probably have a, a puddle of, or it might be, I mean, I don't know if you recorded the palette, but it might be a little bit more complicated. But in general, I'm thinking um, a value for the trees, a dark, and then um, a value for lights, the sunlight, and then a value for um, snow, which is my like whites, but they're not straight white. It's like a little off white. Like a warm white. Yeah. And then, and then from there towards the end, I can put in my like my purest, strongest, um, well, not pure white, but very close to my straight white. And it's probably um, white with like a touch of yellow and blue or something. And then my darkest dark, which is blue with some red. Um, and I, I always save those for the last because then you can strategically place them. I think Sargent talked about that too. Um, 
see it in your your lightest lights and your darkest darks and you can um because not every tree will need a darkest dark underneath it um yeah. probably just that one in the foreground and then you probably want your lightest light somewhere next to it close to it um but yeah it's very simple the way i i i think and i think it just has come with um doing tons of paintings too like I um I make those two puddles and that instantly unifies the painting too. Um, you're not placing all sorts of different um, yellows and reds and blues throughout the um, the the shapes of sunlight and then vice versa in the darks. It's um it's more dark grays, light grays, um, with a slight tint to each one. Right. Well, I, and again, it um, like going back to the idea that the job of an artist is to like abstract shapes out of what they're seeing. Your your job is to interpret stuff, and I guess the simpler you can make it, the easier it is to actually interpret it, and the more successful I think generally your people's artwork will be. You know, mm -hmm. like a uh, when you start to overcomplicate things, especially in something like figure drawing with too much anatomy or you know, you're thinking about things other than just the quality of the drawing, it can potentially just take away from the um, the actual success of the drawing. If you're focused too much on the cool stuff, it um, it, it almost makes the, the drawing less cool, you know? Yeah. Or the painting less cool, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, with the paintings I like, I try to do paintings that I like. So with paintings that I like, they're, they usually can catch you from the from across the room and what i've learned and what i've come to realize is that's usually because strong value shapes um, big shapes of lights and darks um, and usually a an interesting color harmony too that looks natural and believable yeah so that's what i try to do in my paintings um and to do that you can't you can't get caught up in all the little stuff because that little stuff you don't see and it doesn't affect you from from 10 feet away yeah right um yeah yeah absolutely and um i, I guess yeah the more again it, it's it's the thing that everyone else says but if the more you can focus on the small shapes and or the big shapes mm -hmm. uh the more successful your painting will be you know painting flowers and all that kind of stuff it can look cool but you need to do it sparingly and, be very yeah. intentional with the way you you do it mm -hmm. um and uh yeah like, like i mean at this stage you're you know adding uh bark and you're adding some you know ground foliage and stuff but it's only after the rest of the painting is has been kind of figured out already yeah um yeah at this point i think i'm i mean it's kind of hard looking back at a, a painting that i did i don't know you said like three or four months ago because yeah. I, I feel like I've I've changed in my 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 thinking and my process already in that time frame. Um, but like looking at it, I I think what I'm probably thinking in my head is um, that tree in the foreground, that biggest tree is is going to be the tree that is um, catching the most attention. People are going to be like drawn to it because it's so dark and so close. There's so much contrast, so I have to have some interest in it. I need some interesting brushwork, some dry brushing. You saw me use my finger in there. I I do a little bit of not everything, but um, I have a few different ways of creating um, texture or the illusion of texture, and all that adds to the believability of the tree. But I'm not I'm not going in there with a tiny little skinny brush and painting individual pieces of anything. I'm just Right. I'm suggesting them um, with big marks. Yeah, it, it looks like you might be doing the entire painting with one paintbrush, right? I might. I know I, I do it sometimes. I might um, at the end um, bring in a, a smaller, like a um, like a liner. Um, you saw me add a couple branches, but with a scene like this, it's it helps at the end to um, to place in like three to five skinny marks to kind of tie in the scene as a whole. 
um that way it's not all big shapes you need like um you need a little bit of um um uh, small small brushwork in there but the majority of it needs to be big and that adds to the believability too because you when you walk through the woods it's not it's not big shapes it's tons of little little like twigs and everything everywhere so you gotta yeah. um, remember that um and sparingly put it in yeah yeah sometimes i forget and um, i'll i'll send a picture of it to my brother or something looking for advice and he'll be like oh man it's like you just need like three little skinny twigs in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yep, once again, I forgot. Yes. I, I'm so used to just thinking in big shapes. I sometimes forget. And like, to me, it doesn't bother me because I'm constantly going back, looking at my painting from 10, 15 feet away and it doesn't bother me. But when you get up close, you need like something to look at. You need something. To... Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I, I guess it's, uh, you know, they're the primary and the secondary shapes and the secondary shapes are still very important. It's just, uh, only once you figure out the primary stuff and I guess it's a I, I, I guess that's a pretty easy to mistake that's a pretty easy mistake to make because so many art schools and teachers are always pushing the you know big you know focus on the big composition before focusing on the detail stuff mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's also another testament to how no matter how comfortable you are as a painter no matter how experienced you are uh, it's really easy to still forget those simple lessons sometimes you know mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you um, just there, you saw me use the, the handle of the brush to scrape in some um, some texture and some um, like detail, like the illusion of detail. So like things like that I'll, I'll do throughout the process all, with always the, the thought in the back of my head it, um, that I can always go back over it with a big flat shape of color if it if it gets too busy in an area. Um, so you can always, that's the great thing about acrylic is it's really easy to um, just load up the brush with a ton of paint and um, to simplify a big mass again after, after making it too complicated. Right. Um, you can do that with any, with any medium, but um, with oil, for example, like you probably want to scrape, scrape out the, the section before you went over it um, with really thick paint because um, you might just make it more busy or it might get muddy or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I, I always meet people who discount acrylic entirely as a medium, you know, there's something about like oil that is seen as higher value for whatever reason, you know, mm -hmm. but something like acrylic or gouache or watercolor, you know, I think they're really great mediums, but they're also really great learning tools because you don't have to wait you know, 10 hours for it to dry before you can change your painting or add something to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think, um, I, I learn and I improve, um, pretty quick as a painter because I, I use a lot of different, um, types of paint and, um, you, you definitely learn things from each one. Like I've learned, um, tons of things, painting in acrylic that I use in my oil paintings and vice versa. And um, if I only did oil paintings, um, I mean, I don't know, there's something about knowing that your your paint are, um, is like super valuable and like, oh, this is like what the masters have used and they did all these crazy masterpieces um using oil and stuff like that again it adds pressure and it it um it can really get to your head when you're just trying to learn and using acrylic for example it's pretty cheap you can just paint on a piece of paper and um you can create like a really strong painting with it um and you don't have the i mean there's some good acrylic painters but um relatively to me like I feel like I just I don't have um I just don't have like the pressure I don't feel like I, I need to create a masterpiece with acrylic I think of more of it as like a um, um just like an experimental right um, way of painting 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think it's important to put yourself in a mindset when you're actually trying to create something to where you don't feel any negative pressure or any pressure at all. Mm-hmm. Even if it's, uh, you know, good pressure, that sort of stuff can bleed into the actual quality of the painting. You know, you feel, you might feel uh, more trapped or you, know, you might freeze up when trying to do a brushstroke because you're worried about the actual cost of the, of the brushstroke itself, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if you mess it up, then hey, that painting might be ruined and that painting might be like 20 or $30 in oil paint or something, you know? Yeah, uh, it's such a like, detrimental way of thinking. I, so I, I talk a lot with um, the painter C.W. Mundy. I'm sure tons of people know who he is. He's, he's one of the best painters alive today. And um, he, I'm just, I'm so thankful for our relationship. He, he's helped me through so many things and he's helped me improve so much. And one of the things he's always, one of the biggest things I've taken away from painting alongside him and, and listening to him talk is he, he paints like a millionaire Mm -hmm. and that's his, his, um, his thought process or that's his mindset while working. And that has freed me up so much. It definitely helps if you're making money from painting. Like I know it's probably hard at the start to think that way because you might be um, struggling to even buy your paints and and I do too sometimes but it's um to to free yourself up and just think that I'm like I got all this paint right here and I'm just gonna use as much of it as I need to to um to just get this painting to do what I need to to make this painting look right from 10 feet away um and so I'll, I'll squeeze out way more paint than I need and I'll, I'll just scoop it on, scrape it off. Sometimes I'll save some of the grays that get discarded and you can use them later, but um, it's just so helpful to not care as much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it makes it way more fun too. And you could be more of a, like a rock star when you paint like that, you know? Yeah. You're, you're yeah. Just not as, uh, you're, you're, you're way more fluid when you're painting that way, you know? Mm-hmm. I you, have to, you have to have fun. You have to, um, you, you have to take chances and risks. That's the only way to paint. Like you'll never learn if you don't. So yeah. it's so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that mindset in general makes you a better uh, expressive painter as well. Like it just makes what you're saying a lot more interesting, you know, mm-hmm. like people would be way more likely to buy a painting from you. I think if you're somebody who's taking creative risks it's not like you're doing what you always do it's not like you're painting the same painting every time like you're actually experimenting and you know doing things that might like actually might fail you know yeah Um, yeah I'm always inspired seeing um paintings and painters that are that work that way I think that's what's helped me paint that way um every painting, I, I just, I try to go about it a little bit differently. It might be the same scene. Like I might paint that photo that I'm painting in this, in this um, video, I might paint that same photo a few times, but I will, I mean, well, first of all, I'll probably paint it in oil. I've painted it in acrylic. Um, I might paint it huge. And every time I'll, I'll go about it a little differently because I, for, well, it's, it's just more fun. Um, I don't want to, um, have the same process every time. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't enjoy painting. <laughs> right. Sometimes I'll do a whole painting with a palette knife, for example. Right. Well, and and again, I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that there are really no rules to learning or doing art successfully. And uh, I, th- I think that's forgotten a lot of the time, where people feel like they have to do a painting a certain way. Like you can't use black at all, or you can't use whatever. You know, it's. Um, and the reality is, is uh, at least to me, the goal of art is to keep it as fun as possible for as long as possible, you know? And it, yeah. if at a certain point, if it, uh, if it stops being fun, then it defeats the purpose of painting in the first place, um, if you actually stop enjoying it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, Sometimes I have to remind myself of that. I get just kind of bogged down with the, the process or the subject matter. And then, then I remember, oh wait, there's, there is um, uncountable ways to do this painting. Just try a different one 
and then I then I start having fun again and then I get tied into like a whole maybe like a, a month of working in a new way and then I'm and then that leads to something new yeah did you ever get anxious about that you know the variety of how to paint something it's just so expansive that you, you know like you're always doing it wrong no matter what right and, and, <laughs> you know like it's not, like, not you specifically but you know yeah um, um I don't know if you mean like if I um if it gets like if it gets to my head like how like how there's just endless ways to learn to well, I, I guess I when I talk to people in general the biggest thing that I run into is people it's not like people are bad at drawing or painting or anything it's more it's way more that people question themselves and their essentially their own creative ideas way more uh, than they should and that's the reason people can't you know move to the next level of art is because they're constantly questioning themselves you know mm -hmm. um I, I i guess uh how, how do you how do you manage and deal with that you know <laughs> uh well that's i mean you just have to everyone goes through that i i definitely do i it definitely helps to have um friends painters that you can bounce ideas off of and you know they're um, opinions are, um, like you can respect their opinions, um, because they have good work to show for it. Um, that helps. And, um, I don't know. I, I think I, I kind of, um, get through it by just painting more. <laughs> I just, I, I, if I let that stop me from painting, then um i don't know i i feel like i'm getting like conquered by the issue i i need to just like just keep pushing through um yeah i yeah i think that's about it yeah yeah well and i i, I mean it's a. Uh, I think our brains everybody like the part of the human condition is that we overcomplicate everything. We overcomplicate the meaning behind everything. And um, especially with art, we're constantly seeing the best people and we're constantly comparing ourselves to the best people, you know? Um, you, you know, and I think art is especially hard to do in some ways because like you have your favorite top 10 artists and then that's who you compare yourself to, which is like, the top 0.0001% of all time, you know? <laughs> so like everyone is comparing themselves to the top 0.001% artists of all time, all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, I think part of getting past that is acknowledging that it doesn't matter how good anyone else is. It matters like how good you were yesterday, you know? Like you personally, not, not anyone else. And, yeah. Um, and finding love in the process way more than the actual praise you get from you know doing artwork you know mm -hmm. yeah i um yeah i i definitely agree with that i i've seen that quote um I, it pops up every once in a while where you that's definitely the healthier way of um going through um i mean thinking of your yourself and your own issues um comparing yourself to who you were yesterday and i think um yeah for me i've learned to um to get to a point with my with my painting each day or each painting where i'm i'm happy with it i see an improvement or i see something that i like about it i know it's not perfect i know it's not amazing sometimes i surprise myself sometimes i do a painting i'm like wow this is really a breakthrough um but I, I have to just find something in the painting that I'm happy with. And that motivates me to keep going on to the next one. I can't get, I can't get a painting done or close to done and just be like, ah, oh, this isn't as good as, um, I don't know, Sergeant or right. Richard Schmidt or something. It's because it's, it'll never be as good, um, first of all. And it doesn't even matter because I'm a, I'm just a completely different painter. Um, yeah, yeah. I have to compare myself to who I was yesterday. 
Yeah, yeah, and I, I think another big part of it is, uh, you know, a, a question that I ask everybody is, would you be doing exactly the same thing you would be doing would be doing right now if you had a billion dollars? So if you had a, if you had a billion dollars, would you try to paint like Sargent or would you try to paint like you know Rembrandt? You know, it's and if the answer is no, then uh, you actually have no right to compare yourself to them because even if you had all of the money in the world, all the fame and power, you still wouldn't want to be them. You know. Yeah you know, you'd way rather be you than, than that person. And, mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to Z, uh, Steven Zapata about this. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a, another artist guy. And he was saying at a certain point, he gave up the lows with the highs. So he, you know, you, you no longer acknowledge your great successes, which is a bummer, but then that allows you to no longer tie your failures to you being a loser you know it's like the the whole goal is to stop tying any part of your personal identity to the quality of your artwork and just and just do it you know and i think once people can do that the quality of their artwork actually goes way higher because they're not focused on the end result or the uh accolades that, that they might get from from their painting you know yeah and that definitely ties in with doing the um, the quantity of pieces too. If you just keep pushing, keep go, moving on to the next painting, moving on to the next one after you do them, eventually in there, there will be a, a really strong piece. Sometimes a masterpiece will, will evolve in there. I know so many painters that are just so worked up about doing like just getting one painting done and they, they, they think on it for months. They, they do all this just like stressful thinking and they, they just, they, and they, they don't get the work done. And when they don't get the, the practice in the rehearsing, like, I, I think a lot of my paintings, I think about them as rehearsals for, yeah. I don't know, the, the paintings next week, paintings um, in a month from now, like, every single painting is just like a stepping stone for the next one. So when people aren't doing that, when, when they're, when they're, um, I don't know, it's almost like you have to, like, I live like close to the post office and I, I do, I just walk and do a lot of my deliveries. If I spend my whole day thinking about walking to the post office to do the deliveries, the deliveries will never happen. <laughs> I gotta just, I gotta go do it and get it over with and I can move on to the next thing. Absolutely. Well, and I think the problem with focusing on a single painting is that like if you're fo focusing on a single painting, you're probably focusing on the end result of what you're going to get from the painting, you know, yeah. which is I understand that if you have to pay a mortgage, if you have a family to feed, you know, any of that kind of stuff. But from the perspective of you being someone else other than a painter, I, I don't think it's healthy. Like if you're a person, even if you're one of the great painters like Sargent, you're also a husband or a a son or a daughter or you know whatever you're uh, a piano player you know somebody who knits you know whatever you're, you're you're not just a painter you're you're a human being with needs and things other than just being just making cool art you know and I think the more you feed just that one part of yourself the actual uh, like the other parts of you I think start to rebel against that uh, idea and uh, you actually start to go down a, a dark path of, uh, you know, that painting actually stops being as enjoyable, you know, making artwork actually becomes a place of like suffering rather than a place of, of actual enjoyment mm. and genuine fun. Yeah. And um, another thing is when you're a kid doing little drawings on, on the wall or on a, on some, um, construction paper in kindergarten or whatever you're not thinking about the end product really you're 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 just having fun holding that marker in your fist and just putting putting marks down and just yeah it's, uh, just, it's just like process you're just like yeah. you're just seeing what will happen and um I mean it doesn't really change as you get older you you kind of have to force yourself back into that um you can't get caught up in all the um all the things that you think i mean yeah like you said there's the money side of it which you, you gotta think about at some point but 
is your painting, are you really going to sell more or are you really going to make more money, make ends meet if you spend all your time trying to get one painting done? Chances are that one painting will probably be kind of bad. Yeah. Uh, so you might as well do 30 bad ones right. um, pretty quickly. And then in there will be something that's probably a step above the others. And yeah. That, yeah. that one will be the one that sells. I don't right. know. That's the way I think of it. Um, I just, I try to paint a lot and I, um, within those paintings, I'm always surprised something uh, looking back like a few weeks from, um, from doing a painting, I'll look back on a painting and it'll be, I'll, I'll like it. I won't like it in the moment after I did it, but I'll look back on it and think, Oh, I'm, I'm happy. I whipped that one out in 20 minutes in the freezing cold. Yeah. Uh, in the woods. <laughs> well, and I think part of the reason you are a successful painter and you're going to continue to be a successful painter is because you, you know, you have bad paintings still inside of you, you know, <laughs> like you're going to do a bad painting at some point in the future. And you're like, yeah, whatever, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to knowingly walk into that and just do it, you know, like get it out of the way rather than letting it, uh, like, and, and you will enjoy doing a bad painting too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, well <laughs> until I realize it's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, for, for a moment. And then, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's something I'm, I'm thinking a lot about is how, how can I mentally enjoy doing bad paintings? Like, it's still really hard for me at the end of the day when I look at the painting I did and knowing that it's bad, <laughs> it's so hard to... to stop and go to bed um with that bad painting sitting there i it's really hard so i'm that's something i'm i'm trying to figure out and work through i i have to just remind myself of everything we've been talking about really it's yeah. just tomorrow's a new day and i i'm gonna wake up and and do some some more bad paintings hopefully hopefully one of them will be a little bit better where i can find the motivation in that to keep going yeah yeah absolutely Again, I think it's that mindset that affects everyone, you know, whether you're the most famous artist of all time or a complete beginner, it's coming over that, uh, I guess, defeating the dragon of self-doubt, yeah. defeating the dragon of uh, not tying your artwork, the quality of your artwork to the quality of your personality and who you are. You know? uh, I think the video has ended. Um, cool. Uh, well, do you want to uh, tell people how to follow you? Um, yeah, my uh, website, it's a good way, um, tadretz, T-A-D-R-E-T-Z dot com, and then um, my name on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, tadretz. Um, I post more on goals than I do on my website. My website is like, when I've got some downtime, I'll upload some new work to it, but um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, they're so much faster to post new stuff so that's the best way to just see what i'm working on um but if i have stuff for sale that stuff's usually on my website um yeah i have um tutorials too on gumroad um if you just search my name there um, um pdf stuff yeah um can people reach out to you at all or um, yeah, send me messages, direct messages, or I have a contact form on my site. You can email me. Um, I don't know. What, what, what are you thinking of? they're going to um, talk to me about, but... Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe they want to learn from you or something. Or ask Yeah. Or... yeah. Oh, I, I do offer, I have a mentorship um, thing on my website where you can, um, you can upload a couple images of your your painting and whatever you're painting and i'll i'll do a paint over up on on it in um, photoshop and i'll walk you through my thought process of how you can improve it or ideas that i have for it that's probably um uh, the best way to learn i i did that a ton at the start uh, my brother zach retz is a uh, is an artist in the animation industry so he got me really into digital painting and he would do that on a lot of my paintings and it was probably it was just so helpful to get that kind of feedback and that direct feedback too like um seeing your painting improve just all of a sudden and seeing and you can like flip between the two um and just seeing how yeah uh, 
differences? How simply it can be improved sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, I think the job of a teacher is to inspire students and to actually help them do their work. And having somebody to paint over you and your work and tell you exactly where to improve is a lot more useful, in my opinion, than just being in a classroom with a lecture that doesn't apply to you. you know? Yeah, it's much more personal. Yeah. Uh, cool. Alrighty, man. Uh, it's like I, I will stop the recording. Okay.